So welcome to the talk from Niels about uh, dependency resolution into poly polynomial time. So hi, I'm Niels. I am doing my second talk today. This time about something slightly more technical. Um, I wanted to do dependency resolution in deterministic polynomial time, which is <coughs> what this is all about. Um, I didn't get as far with this as I wanted. I wanted to have a tool ready and have some results, which I, which I didn't quite finish. So some of these will just be my findings, work in progress notes. We have six topics I hope to cover. A quick introduction, then a, something about the heart problem, um, then the part where it, it actually turns out to be highly tractable in practice, if you don't think too much about it. And then there's some installing, upgrading, and installing again for how to improve your, ins your solvers. Still in the introduction, I'm hoping mostly to debunk the myth that dependency resolution is a very hard problem that we cannot solve, and we should remove packages in the hopes that they will somehow keep us keep the archive from exploding and the dependency resolvers to break and app to die and God knows what. Um, so, I've been working on Britain, which is a different problem to solve, but it revolves the same techniques, or uses some of the same techniques. Some will be directly applicable to apps, some will not. And there's not a one-size-fits-all solution, sorry, and I much less haven't wrote it yet, even if there was. So, defining the problem, when you try to install a package on your system, there's actually two problems being solved. One is the part where app figures out, if I have to install Eclipse, you will be needing a lot of Java packages, you'll be needing a lot of other stuff. And so it figures out which, is, which packages are needed for this to make sense. And the separate part of the problem, a second problem is, once you have this list, they have to be unpackaged and configured in a certain order for this all to make sense. They are, in theory, two distinct problems. Um, I'll be talking about the first problem um, because that's actually dependency resolution. The other thing is just ordering. The ordering thing is certainly also a very important part. I don't want to dismiss that. It's just, it is, in fact, theoretically a polynomial time problem. So to solve the ordering problem, you basically compute all the action, you given a set of actions that need to be done, then there are some constraints between some of them, like you unpack things before you configure it, maybe you deconfigure something else before that, so you end up with a list of partial ordering constraints. From that you build a graph for some ordering, it's fairly simple to do in practice, if you have the right tools for it. Um, and then without cycles, this is a trivial thing where it just orders it and gives you, this is the order, go fix. When there are cycles, you will get an, a single action consisting of multiple things to do at the same time, which is really impossible to do. It turns out that the way we defined this whole thing, if you have a package that does not have a post install script, it doesn't need to be configured separately. So that means it's just unpacked or not unpacked. And that tends to break most cycles. So if you want less problems with ordering constraints, help us to find a way to get rid of most of the post-install scripts, such as the ones just running lbconfig and nothing else. Um, that could solve some of the cycles, and otherwise it's just feeding it to dpackage and it works. If you have a cycle, yeah, it's a separate problem fixing that. I won't be covering that. As I said, the roll time is polynomial. It's something like the size of a package, a regular graph, which is fairly polynomial. Um, this even covers finding cycles. Um, again, breaking cycles is just removing post install scripts. And of course, if you think this is too simple, you can always implement more features on top of it, such as trying to optimize for minimal downtime of services and all that. You can make any trivial problem very hard very soon with that. So, the hard problem. First of all, the players. We got apt, aptitude, copt, whatever. We got Britney, we got those, EDOS, whatever its name is today. 
um, they solve the heart problem. Or at least they should be trying to do. Notable tools not affected by any. Depackage. So depackage truly figures out if you're missing a dependency. It says, I cannot resolve this, and I don't know where to fetch it, so I'm just giving up. And that is the only th same thing you can do, which means it is not... It only verifies a solution which is known to be polynomial, and therefore it's not a game player here. And DACRM is also doing a polynomial time check. It just happens to be slow for other reasons. So that's basically the known players. There are probably others. But we're moving on to the heart problem itself. So the problem we actually have is we've got version dependencies, we've got alternative choices, we've got virtual packages. All three makes this problem hard. You basically have to remove all possible alternative choices, guesses, whatever, to make this simple. It just so happens if you move version dependencies, among other things, things become really fun. Um, it becomes really easy to solve the problem, but upgrading gets really, really spicy. So how do we ensure the package is configured before your new package using a feature new div package is installed? That's sort of impossible. So it becomes simple, but we end up with a broken dependency graph, so it's not really an option. Technically, there's a way to also make it simple by having multiple versions of things and remove negative dependencies, but that's not necessarily easy to do either. Um, presumably, file conflicts will get in our way or something. We have to redefine where we place all files. That's not going to be something we do anytime soon. So, yeah, it's not really an option. To make a better understanding of the problem, please consider this example. If we have core utils at some version, depending on a new version of uh, a given version of BC, either this version or a newer one, from this, can we immediately conclude that if libc 2.19 is known to be installable, we conclude that core utils will also be installable? How many think people think we can immediately conclude something from this? How many people think we cannot conclude anything from this? Well, that's good. So it turns out, with negative dependencies and without negative dependencies, it doesn't really matter. With negative dependencies, libc or whatever it depends on could just conflict with core utils. We're broken. It's out. And without negative dependencies, you could have one of the things where it depends on a version that's newer or older. And No, it's, it's not really too real to do. You can't conclude something locally in theory. And that's something that can become a problem. Anyway, it is highly tractable in practice. Because if you do have a break, uh, conflicts or otherwise negative dependency, it tends to be up about. So if the previous version of core utils was installable with that version, the new version will probably also be. Likewise, most dependencies, circular or otherwise, tends to be up about. There are cases of version ranges, which is a lower bound and an upper bound at the same time. They exist. They're just not so common yet. And that's a good thing. Uh, and then also the number of alternatives, the number of possible solutions to any clauses actually tends to be fairly limited. Of course, there are the exceptions. Um, packages for unstable, they might just be missing, in which case it's really hard to solve the dependency. Um, you've got mutually exclusive packages like all the send mail stuff, MTAs. The version ranges I mentioned before, and then, of course, the strictly equal versions, which you see inside packages built from the same source package. And the redeeming feature here, same source, because that is actually very simple to figure out if they're from the same source. Um, so they tend to be upgraded in lockstep anyhow. The new versions tend to be available at the same time, sort of thing. But the problem made hard in a nutshell is 
this contrived example, for example. You have a package you want to try, and it depends on any number of foos. And each of the foos can either be solved by picking a bar package or the good one, which is, might be a hint to which one we would choose if we want to solve it. And the bar ones depends on a bad package that does not work with the starting package. We are broken. And the good package just doesn't have any dependencies that they're for good. In the perfect example, you saw it with try foo, good, foo one, and then good, and be done. In practice, if you don't have some way of ordering these so you know one of them is better than the other, you now have an end time M trace where you have to guess up and down which one am I doing, backtrack, back and forth, and all, and it's going to be horrible. And this contrived example can, of course, be solved by some solvers that can see the pattern, but you can always make a more, more uh, contrived pattern that's harder to understand. So I s try to keep it somewhat simple. So the problem here is, the good thing is, very few people write software like this. And that is the most redeeming feature about the package graph. We do have exceptions. A spell dictionaries, I spell dictionaries. They are basically, if you depend on I spell, I spell dictionary, which is a virtual package provided by 50 different I spell packages or A spell packages. And then they depend on something else after that. So in theory, they can, they can be a part of creating this problem. Fortunately, they themselves are fairly simple once you're past them. <coughs> you also have multi-arc foreign or multi-arc allowed with package any dependencies. So if you have multiple architectures, you in theory can have any number of things satisfying the same clause. Um, this gives extra unnecessary work for most resolvers if you enable them to do multi-arc and cross things. But unless you do more than well, we have 12 of them, but I suspect most users of multi-arc are somewhat limited to two, maybe three. Uh, possible exceptions being people like writing solvers and trying them out, trying to torture test them. So, the real problem, if you had to do this in the archive, you would need to do, for example, something like write in different org implementations. We have three. Um, and then afterwards, for example, have m different distinct but equally valid libseed implementations. It's not something we're likely to do in the near future. And you have to do this on multiple levels because you can just pre-solve the essential set most of the time, so this particular thing is not so interesting. And the data packages, they can in theory blow up when you have in true, truly interchangeable data like we do with the ASPL packages. But they tend to be either not having any dependencies after the ASPL, after the data package, or they have a simple loop back into what you came from. So the blow up tends to be limited to one level. It, if you have enough of those, that's still gonna be a problem, but it keeps it simple. So, on to installing. The easy case, as mentioned, is when you have a single suite and a single architecture, a lot of things in the graph collapses into a, what looks like a regular graph and therefore becomes simple, trivial. This actually happens so much that if you take Lynchon, it has 26 d distinct dependency clauses. If you look at each of them, when you only have a single suite and architecture, there's at most one package directly solving each clause locally. Then further down the graph somewhere you depend on, for example, devconf or devconf2, which is one of these alternatives giving rise to blow up. And Lynchian in itself is not subject to becoming a backtrack point. There's no guesswork when you reach Lynchian. Which of its dependencies should I pick? Which version of it? No. That's, that's not there. You have to go further down to see that. So... And actually, by the time you reach the devconf thing, it has already been solved by something else, as I recall. Um, oh, no, wait, the dependencies of devconf is already covered by the time you're forced to resolve this choice. So 
it's not really a big issue either. You just pick the devcon one. C devcon currently depends on devcon, so it's that way trivial. So the question is, when do we have these conditions? We do that a lot, actually. If you do builds in unstable, for example, in a pure unstable C root, only one suite, only one architecture, piece of cake. If you install packages on a pure Jesse system with multi-arc, you have the single suite one, which limits a lot of them, and then you have not the single architecture. That's what it is, but on a pure squeeze, you are guaranteed to not have multi-arc because it didn't work that back then, so that's even simpler. Also, you can do unstable plus experimental or stable plus backports if you, do, if you fiddle a bit with the resolver and say it is not allowed to pick experimental unless it is explicitly requested to pick experimental and from there it only picks what it absolutely needs to solve it. Then you can mostly work around the... Uh, you basically get the same result as a single suite restriction. Um, but that requires you to actually code something for it. And then there's Brittany, which the testing migration thing, and that's because she basically takes things, moves it into a new version of testing, and try to test that this is still the same solution. So she forces it into a single suite currently. So these are common cases where it happens. It's not everything that happens like this. So stable to stable upgrades are still, funny enough, not a single suite and all that. But it happens because there's only one package and architecture, only one instance of a package. It only have one version, it only have one architecture that solves that particular dependency. Whereas if you move the arc, you could have the IA, the IA386 and the AMD64 AMD version. If you do an upgrade, you could have the old version and the new version that might or may not satisfy it. Also, we have this thing where we don't really like libraries to have alternative implementations. It sort of breaks things horribly, especially when they're not actually agreeing on the interface they provide. There's the social aspect of it that we don't really bother having 200 interchangeable implementations or everything. I think the record is something like five or six different versions of SendMail implementations. Do we have more than if sim null mailer and postfix and some other thing? I don't think so, but we might have. And even when you do have a, one of these explosions, it has to actually hide the breakage beneath one of these choice explosion, alternative explosions for it to be a problem. You might have a spell over here on the run hand side, and you have a breakage over here, which is true to find out. So if you solve just the first explosion, so they solve the other part, it realizes this is not working, I'll just bail out. So it's, there's a couple of things that we, um, we do to make this easier. The most interesting thing is, of course, can we still make this simple without the single suite and single architecture restriction? We can do, to some extent. And that's where we move to upgrading in deterministic polynomial time. This is where I spent most of my uh, time working. Um, so, to start with, when we do an upgrade from stable to stable, and here I'm taking pure stable, no backports and all, what we do, the general recommended way to do it is replace Weezy with Jesse, hit up, get update, and upgrade, at upgrade afterwards, and app replaces all the old packages with a new version, if they're then a new version, we also want all the packages from Weezy that do not have a new version in Jesse to be removed, and there might be a new essential package somewhere. So long story short, upgrade if it's present, remove if it's not present, and then install the new essential packages, if any. And they don't tend to change that often. I'll be ignoring the installing part for now. Um, it is, of course, valid and interesting, but We'll skip it. So let's take a simple example. Somewhat contrived, somewhat made up the numbers. They are not too far from reality, but they're not exact either. We have a system. We are upgrading from Weezy to Jesse. I claim there are 30,000 packages in Weezy. We got 35,000 in Jesse. 
The system we are working with has 2,000 packages installed. Mine here has something like 1,200. If you do a simple dpackage DSL and then do a line count, you can see how many you have on your new system, plus minus five or so, to give you an idea of how many packages we're actually working with. And we assume that all <laughs> Reese packages got a new version in Jesse, because I'm about to do a pop quiz. So with these numbers, what is the maximum problem size of this upgrade? Any takers? Is it 30? Anyone for 35? 37? 60, 37? Yeah. One for 65? Yeah, one for sixty-seven five thousand. And who believes I was an asshole and didn't include the right answer? Oh, so little faith. <laughs> I'm glad you believe me. The right answer is thirty-five thousand. Um, oh, it doesn't show. Oh well, the right answer is thirty-five thousand. The trick is. When we do the upgrade, we replace Weezy with Jesse, we do an update, so all the Weezy packages not installed on our system disappears, and then you get all the Jesse packages with the assumption that all Jesse packages have a new version compared to Weezy. You got the 2,000 from Weezy uh, on your system, plus the 35,000 packages from Jesse. So that means your average stable-to-stable -stable upgrade, if you do it this way, is actually only about 40% of the worst case it could have been if you kept the old stable as well. There's also another awesome feature with removing the old stable repository. Uh, it means every time you upgrade a package, your effective problem size decreased by one. That's not all time, always useful. It's not always awesome, not always the thing that solves your problem, but it means if you can actually make app upgrade a single thing every now and then, eventually you might be able to figure out the rest of the upgrade path after you spoon fit it 200 packages or so. Um, as we upgrade, we end up towards, we end up moving towards a single suite situation, so the more things we upgrade, the more we get to a single suite situation. Again, mostly true for pure stable to stable upgrades. And, of course, the right answer would have been 65,000 packages if we had kept the old stable, so that would have been a possible answer as well. Now, upgrading. This, as I said, should be as easy as mark all new essential packages for install, mark everything that has a new version for upgrade, remove stuff, and then figure out if something's missing, then install that. This solves stuff by up, uh, this stuff solves upgrading by installing, so I'm not really interested in doing this because installing is hard. We can do something smarter than that for upgrading. When we do upgrades in a poly polynomial deterministic time, I'm not going to give you a 100% solution. That's not going to work. If I could, I would be very, very rich. So I tend this to sort of find some easy, low-hanging fruits that, that can be solved cheaply, and then you can throw a general-purpose resolver at the rest of the problem after you've done the simple parts. Or you can feed your solver a partial solution and ask it to fix it up. So it has possibly a slightly smaller problem size. It relies on two things. One, it exploits a lot of common patterns in how we do dependencies. And the other thing is, if you have a valid system state, so if you have a, pack, uh, a system where all your packages are in fact installable, which dpackages tend to enforce, you can verify that is true in polynomial time. You can also verify a change to it in polynomial time. So, here I'm going to do a bit of theory and a bit of English in between. So we start with a not broken system. That is, we have a set of installable packages that are mutable, co-installable, and all that. We call that I. Then we can add things to I. We can remove things from this set. We can 
take something and set it in place with something else, basically lay out remove. Um, and that can be done in linear time. If I take a random package, mesh it in, that's constant, maybe, depending on your implementation. The theory is we can compute a new set where we remove something, add something else, we get a new set. And then we can verify this new set is indeed still a valid solution in polynomial time. So with a constant time modification can be verified in polynomial time. The issue of the day is randomly feeding packages in and out of that set is not going to work very well. So we need something smarter than just random modifications. Uh, well, somebody might actually write something that works with that. But anyway, so the first thing I did, as I mentioned earlier, we have these exclusively equal dependencies inside binaries or between binaries from the same source. So I grouped binaries from the same source. If I was to mark one of them for upgrade, I would immediately pull the rest of them as well if they were installed. It happens to also sort out a very common case of breaks replaces when you move files between two binaries in the same source. Um, then you just try to upgrade each of these groups in some order, preferably deterministically, but uh, I didn't get that far. And if the result of one of these modifications are upgradable, we can test that fairly cheap, we commit it, and you just rinse and repeat until you run out of things to test that leads to something new. This works dep largely depending on what you have installed, unsurprisingly. So if you have very few packages, it may work better than if you have more, and sometimes it works better when you have more, and that's really exciting. So I did an um, example VC installation based on what I have installed on my machine. Not quite, but close, or well, well, related. And so libc, for example, was immediately installable by the, upgradable by this procedure and as well as some Java package, worked fine. Mandeby, Eclipse, Xterm, then I had to do a couple packages before that, which were all upgradable. I think libc was primarily it, and maybe some libc Linux thing. But there are a couple of packages you can actually upgrade with this, or set of packages you can upgrade like this. It is, of course, not tested on configurations. In the particular configuration, I could upgrade the package like this, but I don't expect you to be able to do that in all cases. In fact, I find it highly unlikely because we see to Jesse, in we see to Jesse, the package has tons of breaks for all sorts of things. So if you have the right thing there, you break something else, and that has to be upgraded at the same time. And that is sure to build a loop eventually. So basically, what we're exploiting here is the greater than equal version, which is the common way of doing things. We, re we rebuild the package, it gets a new dependence, depends on a higher version of things. That means the foo in stable, how oh, it goes? Right, so everything depending on foo is equitably happy with the version in Jesse as well, because it's a lower bound. Jesse has a new version, so that works very well. This is the common case for libraries with our IBA I transitions, and apparently including libc, and enables you to upgrade from inside out, from the core of the onion and out, if you think of the graph as an onion. Um, the algorithm is fairly dumb, unsurprisingly. Um, it can't solve Perl, it can't solve Python because they tend to involve a new package. You're in pu pulling in a new package, you have to install that and all that. Um, and in Perl, it could technically solve if it would merge groups together into larger groups. Um, but anyway, the runtime of this is something like i2 times i plus e, which is upper bound by i to the power of 4. It's fairly cheap, it is fairly polynomial, it's very trivial to do. We can do better than that, as mentioned. If we can have it figure out that D package needs a new version of libc, we could upgrade this together. It was not a problem in my system, but it might be on others. And then there's the part with D package breaking other stuff, so you might have to upgrade in at the same time or before D package. And then 
end up with some sort of big loop or three structure of groups you have to migrate together or upgrade together and it should just work. Um, there's also the part where we have to handle rename packages and this comes into variants basically. They come in API bump which will be very useful for stretch due to GCC5. Um, Basically, if you want to do a same restriction on this, you could do something like, we have a clause that's not satisfied, but the thing we need for it is a package introduced in the new source, and then we pull that if it has same dependencies we already solve, that sort of thing. Um, there's also the part where people rename the package from foo to foo replacement or something like that. Again, if it's from the same source, we might do some magic here, some heuristics here. Um, and also, at some point, you will end up needing to install stuff. That is actually required for VC2 Jesse because it pulls in a new init system. There, if you have triple no guess solutions, by which I mean the first thing is of the alternative choices is a real package, and there's only one of them. You could solve this automatically in a deterministic way. Um, and otherwise, give up and try something else. So this is the basic algorithm and the basic ideas I put down and I have been fiddling a bit with and didn't get very far with. Um, so far. Installing part two. So after we learned this with upgrading, we can now in single, single suite, single architecture, triple upgrading, we can usually truly reduce the problem size of to some extent. We can do better on the installing part as well. We can um, look at these ASPL packages again, because they are one of the big problems. We have a thing that uh, we have a couple of packages that have that appear to be almost identical, and then we also have packages that are clearly superior to others. Packages that are identical shows up like this. So if you stay long enough in the ASPL package from Russia and the one from Ukraine something very special happens. You will notice that the primary difference between the fields I have selected are the package name and the version. Exciting. Because that means if I can solve, if I can install ASPL UK as the only thing on the system, the same solution is valid for the Russian one. So textually they differ, but semantically they they differ only by name and version, which, and sometimes you can actually have version dependencies that are always satisfied in old Sable, for example, then that's the same game actually. This is a simplified view because in theory you could have a package that breaks, uh, that refuses to work with the Ukrainian one but not the Russian one and vice versa, so they actually become distinct solutions. But the general use of HBL dictionaries tends to be, I need one of them and I really don't care which one you pick. So, we find those by saying they have the same effective dependency clauses. Um, we can also look at the negative dependencies, that's fairly important too. They have to have the same there. And here we need to merge, um, here we have to remember that negative dependencies, we like to think of them as directed, they're not. So it really doesn't matter if foo breaks bar or bar breaks foo, the important part is they don't work together. And then, we have to figure out, we have to assert that they satisfy the same clause. Both of them are a valid solution to the same clause as the other one. And this becomes interesting when you have the dependency ranges, which is not truly a dependency range, but you have two clauses that says, I will need foo greater than version one, and I need it strictly less than version two. Then one of them contains both of them, and the other one doesn't. When you have, uh, you're doing upgrades, for example. So it has to satisfy the same clauses as well. Little trick thing I discovered a little too late. But it's fun. These things can generally be done in polynomial time. That ballpark, I haven't really computed the actual results. But we can go further than that. Because equivalent or identical packages are easy, easy to find, but there's something stronger than that, or better than that, not stronger, better. 
We can also have the case when one of the packages are clearly better than the other. For example, it satisfies this, uh, it has fewer of the same effective dependencies. So I need less to solve this package. It has fewer of the same negative dependencies. So there are few things that do not work with this. This is also good. And finally, it solves at least as many dependency clauses as the other one. This is typically something you find in upgrade scenarios. So where the old version, um, the old version and the new version do not have any different dependencies, for example. They don't have any new conflicts relations. But the new version might solve more reverse dependencies. It might have more packages it can solve. In that case, you can just unconditionally take the newer version, because if the solution works with the newer version, it may or may not work with the old one. But if the, old, if the solution works with the old one, it definitely also works with the new one. So that's it's sort of a freebie. You just solve it for one of them. If that doesn't work, you know you don't have to try the other. That's the important part. And the purpose of this is basically, or the point with these are basically, that identical packages are just two-way substitutable. And this being a one-way substitution instead. I haven't figured out how to find these in general more effectively than I do the identical ones. The identical ones are easier to find. Um, but I would like us to get somewhere we can find these superior packages truly, because they're more useful in general. Or they're there might be more of them as well. And this is as far as I got, including writing slides up to five minutes before the talk. So are there any questions? Or there's a mic there. Or there's a runner. Hello, Hello. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions, in fact. The first question concerns your problem of finding equivalent pop, uh, packages. Yes. Are you aware of the Coinst tool? I have read about it. I have. I read the article about it. I, um, I remember the thing I remember with that was that it it wrote somewhere that uh, this should blow up exponentially, but it doesn't. Well, as with all theoretical hard <laughs> problems, of course, right? Yes. So this tool, uh, in fact, um, tries to group, to, to find out, uh, well, to, to classify packages with respect to, uh, to with which other packages they are co-installable. Yes. And this works. One of the steps is to group together packages which behave the same with respect to co-installability with other packages. So this would be your notion of equivalence, if I understood it correctly. It sounds like it. At, yeah, so at, at least it's, it's very similar. So I so maybe maybe we, we can do this offline later. We can, but this is definitely something you should uh, look at. I think. And my other question is um, about this uh, deterministic uh, p-time installability. Um, I mean, of course, you're well, well aware of the fact that this is a, um, a result which holds under some restrictions of the problems. Of course, as you haven't as you don't claim to have solved p equals np. Um, so can you, for instance, we know already that it's, uh, it, it has this good complexity when you don't have any alternatives, as you also said, neither explicitly nor implicitly, and also when, when you don't have any conflicts, either implicitly or explicitly. Uh, you seem to have an, an, a different class. Can you characterize precisely under which conditions on the dependency graph uh, you get a p time uh, a p time complexity of the problem so if if actually the negative dependency is not an issue if you take a package and the entire transitive dependencies below it um, can always be solved by looking elsewhere in this so you have a set of transitive dependencies and you can always solve it by following a clause where there's only one option or there's an option you already picked earlier, or there's a package you already picked earlier, then locally this becomes a simple regular graph. Well, you can massage it into one. Um, I don't think it happens often enough for us to rely on it at 100%. I think there might be cases or corners of the graph where it happens locally, and then when you leave that part, go further down the stack or outside that part, you get back to the original problem, but you will have parts of it that are locally polynomial, and which would be interesting to find. Mm. 
<laughs> so whenever the dependency problem fail and you have to do it manually, I always thought that this would be an optimal um, place where user could submit their way to resolve the issue to a public place and then share the information so other people could see and then easier to resolve the dependency. And you have things like Popcorn where you already um, upload what package you installed. So it would be, be a very small step to also upload the problems you have and the solutions. So I would like to hear if you have any views on that. I think it could be interesting to have that, but mostly as a way of generating test data for solvers. My take it is that as a user, this problem should be simple enough that we can solve this in the tool so the user doesn't have to manually fix the problem. Um, but as I said, feedback, getting actual test case data might be, might be useful for that. There was a question there. Uh, in one of your slides, you say that in order for uh, upgrade from a stable distribution to the next stable one, uh, it is only considered to be a successful upgrade when you have only packages in the new stable, uh, which means that if you have a package which does no longer exist in the new stable, in the new stable, the package is removed. Is that really a good thing? It's <laughs> this is the short version of it. So usually when there's not a new version in the new stable release, it's because we removed it and we no longer support it. Um, I suppose there are cases where the user might still want the old version of the package to be there if it's installable and all. Um, this is one of the cases where we had might be debating over what is practically useful and what's the theoretical idea of doing a disk upgrade that might collide. So this was just useful for me to get an idea of where I was headed, where, what a problem I was trying to solve, basically. Um, so. So maybe I can just uh, give a remark to, to your, your question. So. Um, the problem when you are trying to pre-compute uh, solutions to uh, insolubility problems, then uh, it also, it, of course, it depends on uh, from which uh, suite you are taking the packages that you want to install or upgrade, but also what you have currently installed in your machine. And this, of course, there are hardly two users who have exactly installed the same packages on their machine. And for that reason, it's, it's difficult to, to pre-compute these, these kind of problems, I, I would say. And the, uh, the other remark is that uh, in practice, even for very, very hard instances, with like you have many different suits from which you install without having any pin preferences uh, among them, stuff like that, in practice, uh, you get very good uh, um, solutions with other solver technologies like uh, set solving, or other, other solvers which can be used as external solvers in, in uh, APT for precisely the same reason as you all already have, have identified. Well, in practice, even hard, theoretically hard problems are in practice often much, much easier than what you could obtain in the, in the worst case. I think we're one? running out of time, so if there's no more questions, I think it's cool. Last one. One last question. Um, so do you have any preliminary results from timings or something like that, for, at least for your system, where you've tried it? No. Um, what I got is from Brittany, actually. Um, I added some stats to Brittany um, because we got a data set from Kali Linux. They were trying to do, go from their version of VC to Jesse, which was in August. So that was before Jesse free froze. And basically, we were working with 70,000 nodes or packages. So basically, all of VC plus all of Jesse had a unique version each. Um, and the interesting thing is that, for example, the average package, average node in that graph had like four, three to four dependencies. The median was three. and dependency clauses and the average was 4.3 and each of these clauses had an average of 
Oh, I can't read this shit anymore. Uh, it had a million of two, um, two possible options for it, and an average 1.8. And this is before Brittany accounts for uh, excluding things. So this is the raw graph, and then based on that, she selects something that is in testing and anything outside that she ignores. So when I have two options, a lot of the time she will throw out one of them because that one is not in testing. So that's, that's the numbers I have. I have some more if you want to see them. But um, it's not very detailed. It's not very, it's not the point where I think I can predict something useful from it. So, okay, thank you, Niels, for your talk. And was really good insight on, into, into the problems of dependency resolving. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.